and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. We have returning guest Anthony Carr from AnthonyCarrPsychic.com, the world's most documented psychic. We had him on here a few weeks ago, and one of the predictions that he made live during the podcast, well, it was out in Astoria, Oregon, close to a drawbridge out there. And I got information about two weeks after we did that presentation from an anonymous source showing documents that there is a multi-million dollar, multi-year project in that same area that has a natural gas pipeline out there. And they just shut it down with no reason as to why, no explanation. They just said, we're shutting it down. We're sorry. That's it. And I don't know what they know that we don't. Also, I need to bring up that a prediction that Mr. Carr made before Mount St. Helens erupted the first time back in, I think, 1980. And he made a prediction again in 2012 that Mount St. Helens is going to erupt again, and it's going to be worse than it was the first time. Now, another thing interesting is when we had the presentation last time, we talked about uh, Astoria, Oregon as well, how Mr. Carr saw possibly a plane crash close to that bridge and flames. And what I didn't bring up on the last podcast was I had a friend that actually passed away from a plane accident that he got in out there, and it was a small Cessna. It was just a private plane. That was very interesting. He might have picked up something there. Mr. Carr is acclaimed psychic to the stars, being called the most documented psychic in the world because of all his predictions that have come to fruition, such as the events of 9-11, India's Taj Mahal Acost, the attack on Paris, bin Laden and Gaddafi's death, and many more documented predictions. Now, he's also received repeated accolades from the Toronto Star for his astonishing predictions, and tonight we're going to discuss the top 11 predictions for 2016 and beyond. It was just going to be 10, but I had to throw one more out there that I just figured it has to be on everybody's minds right now. And you talked about this many years ago, Anthony, about Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president, and she's going to be much more of an iron fist than Thatcher was. How are you doing? Thanks a lot for joining us. Well, my pleasure, Rex. And I'm once again very happy to be here. I enjoyed our uh, podcast from last time. And... What were we talking about during our last podcast? Was it the world predictions or was it the Houdini uh, mystery code unrevealed, unraveled? What was the show last time we did? Well, we talked a lot about... Nanny, 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 nanny. Go ahead. Well, you know, I mean, remember last time we talked a lot about the the possibility of our DNA being altered from, you know, an extraterrestrial species, possibly the Anunnaki. Right. And then you made that prediction live on the air, which was incredible. So, you know, one of the things that you've written predictions down now for years, and you've got just so many of them, I picked through some of the gems in your Stargazer updates here, and I wanted to, to just bring up the first one with the, the Hillary Clinton scenario. Now, when you came up with that prediction, I mean, it was quite a long time ago. What was it like, the vision that you had? Well, um, I had uh, envisioned, uh, and remember, these visions do not come with any soundtracks for me. Uh, my grandmother was Claire, was Claire Audio. This is the one I, I, I think I mentioned uh, before she missed the Titanic by uh, four hours. Uh -huh. And she never saw visions that, in that she was not a clairvoyant, but she was a clairaudio, clairaudio, clairaudio. She could hear the universe talking to her, and in a sense, or, or internalize it, or the sensation of feeling it, the, the vibrations transformed into uh, words in her psyche. And uh, the, the universe, of course, takes pictures of everything. It also records all the sounds. So some people are clairvoyant, that is clear seeing, seeing and others are, um, pardon me, I just washed my mouth, I can't do a thing with it. But the, the clairvoyant, that is clear seeing, has, has pictures in the mind's eye. Clair audio, you hear things, hear voices, hear sounds. Others are clairsentient, you get that, as you know, the expression, the gut feeling. When it came to Hillary Clinton, I saw her standing on the podium with four fingers up in the victory sign. This was, oh, 10, 12 years ago, long before... Uh, she had, uh, announced that she was going to run for the presidency the first time. So I had to make out my uh, yearly predictions for my book, Stargazer, Predictions and Prophecies. And so I said I have a strong feeling or a strong uh, vision 
of, uh, if I have to interpret the picture correctly in my mind's eye, and quite often other people could probably interpret my visions better than I can, because as I've said, uh, I have no soundtrack that goes with it, and no subtitles, as in the old silent movies. <laughs> so, even I have to guess at what the universe delivers to me, because a lot of people think, believe psychics and the like uh, can manipulate the universe, make things happen as though we are um, imbued or endowed with a power, um, uh, unlike uh, most other people, but it's not true. We are nothing more than vehicles much like your computer, your radio, and when it's fine-tuned just correctly, these images and visions and sounds will come through. Quite often, if, if uh, you or anyone else is looking at the screen in my mind's eye, which is controlled by the third eye or the pineal gland, which is between your two eyes, your two eyebrows, and slightly above it, which is why we look upward when we're, when we're uh, trying to analyze a picture, we're looking heavenwardly, and uh, again, I saw her with her fingers up in, in, in victory, and I thought to myself, well, I says, I got a feeling, oh, and then I, there was the word president, the presidential race, and the word GOP. And by the way, not to digress too much, what does GOP mean? <laughs> the grand old party. Grand old party. <laughs> That's what it sounds? That's what yeah. it stands for? Yep. Grand old party. Oh my God. Oh, Cracker Barrel. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, I, I saw the word president and GOP, so I, I, I took a wild guess and uh, at my own vision and said, I think she'll be the, uh, ultimately she'll be the first woman president of the United States. Well, of course, years later, she came um, perilously close. Um, there's still a very good chance, and I can't renege on my predictions, you know, I have to stand by them because, as you so eloquently put it, I am the world's most documented psychic. It should be subtitles in brackets, not necessarily, not necessarily always the most accurate. <laughs> so anyway, I, as you well know, I don't make uh, make any bones about it. I am definitely not a Donald Trump fan, and um, I can't. I mean, he's a great entertainer. Uh, our late mayor uh, Rob Ford was very, very entertaining in, in the same uh, uh, ilk as Mr. Trump, and also. Uh, one of our former mayors, Mayor Lassman, was also of that ilk, very entertaining. And for my money, all you're ever going to get from any politician, no politician is going to change your life at all, one way or the other, whether you like him or don't, except if they happen to be very entertaining, and that's all you're going to get for your vote. If you look at Mr. Trump as an entertainer, he's terrific. If you look at him as a, a presidential hope for it, it's, it's, it's to be feared and dreaded. I just can't see him becoming... Uh, becoming president of the United States. Um, to me, the vote for um, uh, Donald Trump would be akin to voting to uh, Adolf Hitler. And I never thought I'd ever say anything good about Hitler, but at least Hitler was a real soldier in that he served in World War I. And uh, Mr. Trump, uh, with his money, uh, bought himself uh, out of uh, Vietnam. But he seems to be very quick to want to send everybody else's kids to war. So I don't have much use, as we've already discussed, for spoiled rich kids, you know, who were brought up with a silver spoon in their mouths. Not just him, uh, the, the, even here in Canada, you have your Conrad Black, you have your uh, our Prime Minister, um, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, I have all the respect in the world for a man uh, and a woman who can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and make it on their own without anybody handing it to them, because... Anyone that's spoiled really doesn't know what it's like on the other side uh, of the spectrum to be that poor, uh, to have to come up the hard way, to have people look down on you. He will never, or anybody like him, will never really, really enjoy what they have. They may think they're enjoying their cars and their millions and their billions and their women and all these things, and I'm sure they are, but not as much as if they truly had come from dirt, poor poverty, and then pulled. That way they would have the other side to judge against and to truly appreciate what it really is to be well off. Right. And do you feel that if Trump was to make it into office, when you compare him to Hitler, do you think that he would round people up based upon their lineage and heritage as well, kind of, you know, these roundup camp? Hey, there's a law for the rich, there's a law for the poor. And basically, uh, he's, he's a white 
supreme, racist, supreme, what do you call it, white supreme, supreme, and that said, for all his blow and his bluster, if it came right down to it, and he actually did become president, I think, being a blowhard, that he would just back down a lot of, on a lot of the things that he's uh, uh, promised to do. Um, I don't think he really has the guts to, to go out in the street and get into what I would call a fist fight in that sense. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, gung ho and uh, uh, what's that line from uh, Macbeth? Uh, Let the devil take the hindsight. You know. Right. But um, as one of his quote unquote friends said on uh, W Five, which is the CBC uh, national television show here in Canada, he said, he says fight. He wants to send young boys into war to fight. He, he's, I've known him all his life. He's never even been in a fist fight. He wouldn't even know how to throw a punch. So, um, I also had predicted uh, obliquely that um, that the President Obama would be the president uh, at that time, 10 years ago, but at the same time I made the prediction about Hillary. I said he would be removed from the dark place thrice. Once, twice, thrice to become... Uh, president of the United States. Well, I had no idea who he was, or so it was just something that came to my came to my mind's eye. And uh, it turns out, uh, apparently, he was his father was from Africa, uh, and then they moved to where was it, Hawaii, and some other, and then he ended up through the generations here in the United States. And that's about as about as close as I came there um, without knowing his name per se. Okay. Anyway, I have to stand by what I wrote about Hillary. Then you know I. Could be totally, and I don't have any bias one way or the other for or against her, you know, as I have with uh, Mr. Trump, or Mr. Trump. But um, you know, it could be that because she came so close there uh, during the last presidential race, that could have been it. But this may be the time for her now. Well, I got a hundred dollar bill that she's actually going to be the next president, just because she's the one playing by the. Uh, the rule book so well of the you know usurpist elitist aristocrats that seem to be so influential within the world now you know and I've also noticed in a lot of your predictions for 2016 they are pretty dire and I wanted to get into this one that you bring up established let's, let's not forget you'll notice in all my all of my predictions in my annual books it's always uh, predictions uh, stargazer predictions and prophecies for the year two or whichever year two sixteen dash and beyond. Right. It's certainly not going to limit myself to 12 calendar months of the Julian calendar by, by our standards when the universe itself, there's no such thing as time at all. Time does not, in fact, forget the word time. Things come into existence, they wear out, and they disappear and become other forms. The energy dissipates. Forget uh, sequential time as we have created so that we don't bump into each other on the street. And remember, before and his name escapes me, who invented uh, daylight savings time? What was his name? Um, Flesh Flat. Did we start with an F? Or did he? Flat? No, Flat was Fleming the one who accidentally discovered penicillin. Stan Stanford Standish. And wasn't he the one who who started the uh, different time zones? Um, I am not sure. British, uh, the Meridian, British Meridian time, uh, which passes through Greenwich and all that. Before that, I mean, every town, every burg, even in America, uh, if they're 50 miles apart, their noon wasn't the same as the noon as the other town, only 50 or 100 miles away, you see. So was it Alexander Fleming? Fleming. One of the things that we, we didn't talk about was the prediction that you made on these, uh, you know, euthanasia, these centers around the globe, I think. Let me, let me read this prediction that you made here. This is pretty astonishing. Establishment of euthanasia centers as the mass of infirmed humanity becomes overwhelming. That's right. I uh, <laughs> know where I got that idea from. I, I remember vividly seeing the movie Soylent Green mm -hmm. with uh, the Charles, Charles, Charlton Heston. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, it, it, will, come, it will come to pass that these centers were the age, the infirm, um, um, genetically, you know, genetically misshapen people, um, suffering greatly, no longer wishing to be uh, on this plane of existence. Well, walk into one of these places, be given a, a meal, a drink, 
in some kind of uh, hemlock, as it were, like Socrates, and just drift away. Uh, hopefully without um, becoming uh, food and fodder for the rest of the population, as it was in Soylent Green. Soylent now, Green's people! No. <laughs> That's right. Now in Canada, we had the first official, I think anywhere in the world, here in Toronto, uh, sanctioned uh, doctor-assisted suicide, um, uh, I guess barely a month ago as we speak. So it's already beginning, and I, I think they're, they're already doing that in uh, Sweden and Holland and those Scandinavian countries. So you're going to see more and more of this pop up as the, uh, as the population, the baby boomers, um, including myself, uh, begin to age more and more, and to the point where well, we're already overpopulated on this planet as it is. Uh, you know, we're, we're crammed into a crammed onto a planet which is really only comfortably capable of sustaining three, three and a half billion. And here we are, what nine billion? Well, we're over seven billion people, and one of the things that I found interesting was I looked up the other day how much water it four hundred and forty four gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. And with over 7 billion people, <laughs> and with as many people liking Big Macs and as much beef as they're eating, you know, I mean, you bring up a good point. Are there too many people on the planet right now? Well, I mean, with the way that we're keeping balance, I would say it's debatable. So you bring up a good point there, you know, I mean, you really do. Okay. And, uh, and now we know that the earth is covered by water, what, three quarters, seven eighths? About that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of that, of the land that's left, well, you've got the Antarctic, you know, you've got the North Pole, you've got great deserts, but I mean, how much, um, uh, uh, how much uh, ir irrigational land, uh, cultivating land that you can cultivate and live on, so on, is really left, and all the peoples will always gravitate to where all the action is, always uh, the immigrants, the immigrants come to the major cities, you don't want to stay in rural America or rural Canada, what used to be the case in the old days, when they, when they uh, came here, they were given allowed to uh, to uh, till their own land, cultivate their own land, build their own home, and if they kept it for four or five years, the land, two or three acres, would belong to them. That was the uh, deal that the government made with immigrants. It doesn't seem to work that way anymore. So, unless unless people start going far afield and start new towns and, and villages to spring up, I mean, we're, uh, we're really, uh, we're, we're, we're hitting on a Collision course with disaster, absolutely. There's too many people, and everybody's crowding into all the major cities, and it just isn't the room and the trade for all of this, and, and the uh, foodstuffs, and everything's polluted. I mean, Lake Ontario here, the Great Lake systems, they're trying to clean them up, but I can remember as, as a child fishing right out of Lake Ontario and taking a trout home and, and you know cleaning it and frying it up with butter and smell fishing right out of, uh, right out of the... Uh, uh, Toronto from the Toronto Islands where, where I lived as a, as a kid and even there, well, in fact not only can't you do it anymore I don't believe there are any smelts left anywhere in the Great Lakes systems uh, I'm probably wrong there must be some somewhere but you wouldn't dare eat them because lakes are too polluted I think I mentioned to you before if God were a star traveler uh, or in this case if God was a star traveler it was meaning it's very possible or is it's highly improbable so if God was a star traveler the only thing that would save us from being consumed as, uh, as food would be the pollutants we've taken into our, our systems over the uh, eons. They would have to have a stamp and imprimatur that it would smack right on our butt saying unfit for alien consumption. Now, you also have a prophecy, Anthony, where you talk about a cashless society and you talk about a tattoo on people's forehead. I was wondering if you could describe that vision with us. Well, um... When you get to be my age, and you'll find a lot of probably your parents as well, you have this uh, annoying habit of complaining about the price of everything. Annoying habit to everybody else. <laughs> because, you know, I, you know I, I go to a movie, it's uh, $10, 11 even, even with, the, with the discount for seniors. And when I was a kid, you know, I was saying, you know, you know, son, when I was your age, this movie here was 35 cents. I could go to the movies with 50 cents, and buy popcorn and a drink and still come up with change. And we're getting to the point where we're going to need a wheelbarrow full of money, just as they did in uh, World War, uh, World War, post World War Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. You needed, needed a wheelbarrow full of Deutschmarks just to buy a loaf of bread. 
I mean, you know, I mean, a coffee is two, three dollars. What do you call it? I always call it frappy, frappy or rule, whatever they're called. You know, five and six dollars, and it just goes on and on and on to the point where you need a thousand dollars in your pocket just to walk around. A thousand dollars is nothing anymore. I can remember when a thousand dollars was uh, was a fortune. You know, you hear people talking about uh, billionaires these days. You know, he's a millionaire doesn't mean anything. You have to have a million dollars. Nobody. I've got a million dollars. So that's nothing. The average house in Toronto is now uh, just been um, assessed at. Uh, I'm talking here about a small bungalow, you know, three room brick house. Nothing fancy. One million dollars and a bit which is ridiculous, outrageous. The same house I live in, I bought for $25,000 in 1964, is now worth just slightly under a million dollars. And we're getting to the point where you're not going to be able to have enough cash to carry around. Any. Already we got plastic and we got the, uh, what, debit and credit cards and so on. And I believe, as, I said, as it says in, in the book of Revelation, that the uh, Number 666, and you've heard this many times, and I've said this for the last 50 years, would be some giant computer of sorts which would keep a record of uh, all the transactions of all the peoples in the world, and quote, and he who is without the mark of the beast shall perish, in that if you don't have a good credit rating or you don't have the mark tattooed on your forehead or your credit card numbers, and you probably don't forget, I said it would be marked in the palms of in the, in the hands of the individual, the palms are on the forehead. Well, in a sense, when you hand your credit card up to somebody, it's in your palm. Um, I may, this may go a step a step further, and they may actually put a chip in, start putting chips in human beings, so you just flash in front of something, and there you are, your credit rating and everything else. So, you know, in light of, in light of um, the apocryphal books, the apocryphal books, which were not included in the regular Bible, because they didn't really make any sense at the time. In light of modern day uh, science and electronics, uh, it begins now to make perfectly good sense, as do the theories that uh, God possibly was a star traveler and so on with the glowing suits and so on and so forth. So we're going to have to come up with, uh, with some other form of currency, whether it's bottle caps or belly button lint. Uh, you see a lot of these commercials on television with these jewelers that say, Ah, oh, bring me your old gold. I give you brand new money. You know, <laughs> oh boy, they smart. Let me tell you. So definitely, we are going that way. But let me tell you, if I had known I was going to live as long as I I've lived, I would have taken better care of myself, and I would have bought gold, <laughs> because forget what gold is worth. You know, oh, gold is worth fifteen hundred dollars an ounce. Gold is worth doesn't matter what it's worth in dollars, because dollars will cease to exist. Remember, remember the motto, gold is gold. You can always take it and trade it for something, whatever it is. Right. Well, have you ever heard the saying, you can't eat gold? Well, that's, that's the, other, um, the other end of the spectrum. I always uh, find it amazing that governments treat farmers abominably. I mean, they're, they're taking away their lands. They, they don't give them any tax breaks. I mean, it just goes on and on. And I always, I've always said to myself, uh, what would we do without the farmers? What would we do without the land? And you can't eat fish all the time, and especially since even the oceans are becoming polluted now. Oh yeah, I mean Fukushima has devastated many parts of the Pacific, and it's not getting much better in the Gulf either with all the core exit and the disasters out there. However, I need to add to that because I've got a friend that reached out to us here at the Leak Project a few weeks ago, and he actually works deep sea. He'll go out for 28 days at a time in the Gulf, and he sent me pictures today close to oil, um, you know, close to drills out there, and the water is crystal clear. I mean, you can see down 40, 50 feet, this aqua blue. It's beautiful. It doesn't look anything like the water next to Corpus Christi by any means. That's true. If you go, if you go out far enough and deep enough, um, but you know, at, at some point, even that could be uh, threatened if, if we keep going the way we're going. And that's why every so often you have the Earth doing, uh, you have the Earth flipping its lids or flipping its polarities. The uh, up is down and down is up, and you have the oceans and the mountains changing places every twenty-five or thirty thousand years. Uh, I.e., Atlantis. Uh, we now know that the North Pole, the Arctic and the Antarctic, they've done drilling down there looking for oil, and they pulled up uh, petrified tropical vegetation over 40 or 400 million years old. So it begs the question, what happened? 
that we know uh, are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And the the pole shifts could have possibly been caused. What do you think caused the pole shifts, Anthony? Well, there's a very very interesting book I read years ago called Worlds in Collision, and it's by Emmanuel Emmanuel Velikovsky, and he was uh, 19 late 1940s 1950s uh, cosmologist. And one of his main theories was that uh, Jupiter, uh, the red spot on Jupiter, was once the occupying space of uh, spot of uh, uh, Venus. Now, you know, in Greek mythology, it says Venus sprang from the head of Jupiter full grown. And if you read the accounts of what was going on in the world back in the biblical days, especially the ten plagues of Egypt, uh, they referred to Venus as, um, as the Beelzebub. Satan, uh, what happened was, according to Velikovsky, it came so close to the Earth that it caused the Earth to shudder, hesitate in its uh, orbit, and reverse its polarities, causing uh, the oceans and the mountains to change places. The only reason Egypt was spared was because of the pivotal point of uh, where it's situated, and that the oceans kind of flowed away from it and settled in the deep crevices of canyons and so on and other mountain ranges, and there are whole valleys and mountains um, that, that, that on the uh, ocean floors uh, as, as high as mountain ranges, as high as we have uh, the Rockies. And uh, there's no doubt that that's, I think every so often, when the earth gets too polluted or too corrupt, it just, I think nature does a, does a cleansing process, and this is what happens. Uh, we came pretty close to it there with the Ice Age, uh, what's that, 25 or 30,000 30, years ago. And when the um, glaciers were, uh, uh, when they retreated, they left the, you know, the Great Lakes and all those 10,000 lakes in Minnesota and so on. So all that, uh, um, to, uh, what was it, the, the year 2000, what did you refer to it as? We're worrying about computers breaking up. Mm -hmm. and, yep. To our, to, to our, what was that, to, remember that, the, the, um, the acronym for that? I the Y2K? Y2K, that uh -huh. was it. Not only that, I'm selected on top of it. But anyway... I mean, that's the least of your problems uh, if, we're, if we're to be confronted by something like that again. And I think, I think we are. So probably the, over the next hundred years, the safest place to be is probably up, at that, up on that space station where they could just, you know, hang out until everything settles down again and return. <laughs> and, you know, there's a very good possibility that if a proxy war goes overboard that the entire globe could be, you know, a domino effect, multiple countries going after each other. And one of the prophecies you make is flee, flee to the mountaintops, the darkest caves, the, the bowels of the earth. World War III is upon us. The Mideast will ignite like a Roman candle. This current skirmish is aught but a prelude to global conflagration. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. What Now talk to us about this prophecy. This is spooky. Well, again, this I thought this possibly would... would I, po I thought this possibly was going to refer to um, uh, Gaddafi Duck, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, <laughs> when he set fire to uh, the oil fields in, uh, in uh, was it Saudi there, was the, um, the, the, uh, the Emirates, the, the oil Emirates, remember the, um, when they had the war and he, he set all the, um, he set all the... Yeah, the Saddam Hussein in Iraq? Yeah, uh -huh. he set, remember, hundreds of them uh, aflame. A bunch of them, yeah. Yeah, and just before that I had made that prediction. And uh, as the, as the um, years go by, it seems to me it was just, as I've mentioned there, just like throwing a, uh, a pebble in a mill pond. Uh, the ripple effect will just keep reaching out and out and out until it engulfs the whole world. You've got all of these so-called Arab terrorists, I just call them snakes with arms and legs, not real terrorists to me. Uh, eventually, you've got, the, you've got sleepers, you've got moles. Uh, they're all over here in Canada, they're in the, the United States, and uh, on command, they'll rise out of their rat holes and, and cause as much grief and destruction as they possibly can. And if you think about the adage that uh, the human race does, if the human race does not benefit to learn from its mistakes of the past, then we are destined to repeat them. And I'm uh, old enough to remember the end of uh, the war, and... Um, you know, uh, the history of it, and, and my parents, who were all soldiers, and including my mother and so on, and they were terrified of the Nazis and the spies, the Germans and the Japanese and the Italians, 
uh, who were uh, hiding in the United States, in uh, Canada, and they had to be rooted out and rounded up and put in concentration camps, including my father, who spent two years in a con concentration camp until uh, Mussolini was assassinated and the uh, and then, uh, Italy returned to the Allies and he was set free and then he joined the Navy and went from, you know, bad guy to hero in the whole six years of the war, you know. So that's what we're looking at here. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse until, until somebody pushes the button, uh, another 9-11 or something of that, and then it's just going to quit. Then you got to gain too many people. Have you been, have you been, to, have you been to Europe, Rex? I have not. Well, you know, uh, I went traveling with uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone's mother, who's a brilliant astrologer, I should add. And um, we, you know, she hit on this thing called rumpology, which was just a big joke. It was reading the bums of people because they give off electrical perturbations. And, uh, and we traveled uh, all over. We went to New York and L.A. and Germany and Israel and Paris and... Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Moscow and and you know it, it, it brought to, it brought to my attention how small Europe really is. Uh, you, you stand in you know if you're in Berlin, if you're in uh, Israel, um, any of those uh, uh, eastern countries where they're fighting uh, uh, the the Hebrew people, like you see, you walk five feet and you're in another country. And I I used to wonder why. Europeans could speak four or five languages. Well, now I know. There's no room. All you have to do is, you know, what is it? The, the, the left bank and the right bank and, the, and the, the, the Arabs fighting the Jews and Jews fight. It all comes down to, again, too many people, not enough room, not enough arable land. And like if you throw a bunch of rats in a cage, you know, overcrowd it, they'll start cutting each other's throat in order to give themselves some breathing space. And this is what happens with the human race. It will certainly explode, absolutely. Unless nature, um, you know, eradicates uh, two thirds of the human population and start all over again, it just forget politics, forget the religion, forget all that. It comes right down to uh, survival of the fittest or the smartest and the luckiest. Are you going to stay in the city where you're at when that happens? Oh, well, at my age, you know, <laughs> I would. I'll tell you the truth. I mean, nobody. I mean, nobody's in a big hurry to die, but. I wouldn't want to be a young person uh, just starting out and have to s try to survive World War III uh, and what's coming up after it and during it. I firmly believe that these, uh, I mean, as you know, I'm not a religious person in the traditional sense. That kind of uh, belief in God to me is just like believing in Santa Claus. Uh, when my mother told me when I was uh, of a certain age, when she told me, that uh, Santa Claus didn't exist. Well, for me, that kind of God didn't exist either, you know. Uh, um, there I was, she broke my heart at the tender age of 32. She didn't tell you to tell Santa Claus was 32? <laughs> <laughs> you mean Santa Claus ain't real? <laughs> <laughs> I knew what side my brain was buttered on. I said, what? There's no Santa, you know. So, I mean, you know, uh, our Western culture believes in that kind of personal God in the sense of... Uh, you know, he's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's not in nice. Santa, God is coming to town. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two are interchangeable. So, but, you know, I think back in certain passages of Genesis, and, you know, Cain slew Abel, was it Abel slew Cain? Cain slew Abel, and uh, ran into hiding, and God says, oh, I see you, come out, Abel. Is it Cain slew Abel? Cain, right? Come out, Cain. You know, no, I don't want to. Well, you think of... Um, these, uh, these computers that uh, the, the military, they can put a smart bomb right into a mouse hole somewhere in a little adobe hut way out in the middle of the Sahara Desert and put it. If we can do that now with our um, modern technology, how much more would these gods be advanced that they can see everything that goes on uh, from a distance from wherever they are in that sense that they have to be extraterrestrials who are far, far advanced uh, uh, the, uh, than we are and can do incredible things including possibly raising the dead through cloning and we're just experimenting with DNA and, uh, and um, uh, uh, DNA and the stem cell research and all that now it, it, I, I just feel that like I said you know we're either dead that's all there is to it and if you've ever had surgery and you put that needle in your arm you're out you don't worry about 
whether you're going to live or die or it's an afterlife, you're just you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. Second possibility, of course, is that uh, uh, the electrical spark that leaves the body at death retracts into its original shape like a little spark as when you throw a log on a fire and it contains in that little spark everything you've ever done, your memories, all of the, your loved ones, your pictures, all of that, your noises and sounds, and returns to the universe uh, in much the same as your, um, your computer has uh, memory banks. And I think we discussed this last time, uh, just because uh, someone has a stroke or they've had brain damage uh, through an accident of some kind, that uh, information is not lost, it's there, it's just uh, irretrievable at the moment. And that was uh, one of my predictions, which I noticed you didn't include in the list here, but that uh, the possibility of uh, bringing back the memories of people who have been uh, suffered Alzheimer's or been damaged is now uh, in the process of being retrieved through a, a, an incredible new medical breakthrough to do with the blue light that's um, uh, shone, uh, that is shone upon a particular cell that the clone from one of the living cells. I have the, the paper here, but I had made that prediction uh, several years ago. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, it's somewhere in my books here in the medical lab. You know, I had no idea before, the first time that we did the presentation that I spoke with you, Anthony, I did not know all of the people that are in Hollywood and other positions of prestige. I, I didn't know that you rubbed elbows with them. That's pretty cool. You've met some amazing people along the way, that's haven't you? I rubbed your palms. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And what I remember you, you described the palm of Michael Jackson on your website, anthonycarpsychic.com, and you talk about how the lines show that he's going to have an abrupt death, a painful life, and just the amount of information that you can pick up with somebody's palm is it's mind-boggling. That story ran, it ran in the, in the tabloids, you know, the Globe, and uh, I think he was only 10 or 12 years old, and I, I said, for some reason, I said, this kid is going to come to a tragic, tragic end, uh, scandal, sex, heartbreak, and bankruptcy, and finally death. Those were the, I think, four uh, categories. That was 1984. I never did forget that. And as recently as I ran in the National Enquirer about, I think, six months before his, uh, his final illness, so to speak. Do you read the left palm or the right? Both. Uh, Left palm, left palm is uh, your inherited traits, the things you were born with uh, from your past, your past lifetimes, uh, things that you bring with you into this existence. And the right hand contains all the things that you're trying to control and, and uh, pick up in this incarnation uh, called life now on Earth. And I, I believe, um, just like in astrology, in astrology charts, you can't overcome your fate or your destiny, uh, which is in the left hand. Um, ultimately, you will do be delivered the things that your destiny, your chart, if you're into astrology, or your palm, your left palm, or your left hand promises. Now you can reverse that process if you're left-handed. The right will be the inherited the traits and the talents that you inherited from your forebears. Depends on that cord uh, that separates the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. Was it the corsum, corpus corsalium, or something like that? Then the electrical current crisscrosses there. Some, some to some people, very few of them are uh, ambidextrous, so they can use the left hand uh, equally well as they can the right hand. And here's that um, most feared diseases. Blah blah blah. Medical science makes dramatic advances in three of the world's most feared diseases. So much so that entire populations will breathe a collective sigh of relief, almost palpable. Even death itself will be conquered. Familiar protein enzymes will herald a major breakthrough in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and other like diseases, organic in nature, something in them adheres to and breaks down the elements which trigger deterioration of the brain that causes these debilitating physical aspects, trembling hands, etc. This treatment will stop them in their tracks. The same treatment will be applied to sufferers of Alzheimer's with equally remarkable results. And this article came out, uh, let's see, it came out, and as we speak here, I'll just, anyway, it was in one of your American papers, and, ah, here it is. Could memories, now this is March 19th, right? And I've been making that 
prediction I read to you, oh, 20, 30 years ago. Could memories lost to Alzheimer's be recovered? Uh, scientists had assumed for a long time that the disease destroys how those memories are encoded and makes them disappear forever. But what if they weren't actually gone, just inaccessible? A new paper published Wednesday by the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, Nobel Prize winning Susumu Tanigawa, Japanese of course, provides the first strong evidence of this possibility and raises the hope of future treatments that could reverse some of the ravages of the disease. The important point is, this is proof of concept, he says. That is to say that even if a memory seems to be gone, it is still there. It's just a matter of retrieving it. So, uh, it has something to do with the, the test of this thing on mice. Both groups of mice were given a mild electric shock to their feet. First group appeared to remember the trauma of the incident by showing fear when placed back in the box where they had been given the shock. The Alzheimer's mice, they injected them with Alzheimer's cells or something, on the other hand, seemed to quickly forget what happened and did not have a negative reaction to the box. But the reaction changed dramatically when the scientists stimulated tagged cells in their brains in the hippocampus. That is the part of the brain that encodes short-term memories with a special blue light. When they were put back in the box following the procedure, their memories of the shock appeared to have returned and they displayed the same fear as their healthy counterparts. So, Tanawanga says, and his colleagues wrote that the treatment appears to have boosted neurons to regrow small buds called dendritic spines that form connections with other cells. Uh, this revelation, or these revelations have shattered a 20-year paradigm of how we are thinking about the disease. Um, memories were just, uh, the technique used in the study, optical stimulation of brain cells or optogenetics involves the insertion of a gene into parts of the brain to make them sensitive to the blue light and then stimulating them with the light. So the potential to rescue long-term memory loss in dementia, uh, dementia is exciting. So I made that prediction years and years ago, and here they are uh, substantiating what I've long believed, that uh, the electrical neurons, the energy, the soul, that electrical spark that leaves the body at death, is that which is immortal. That is, there's no male, there's no female, because genitalia is only for the purpose of uh, procreation. That little spark is what we call the immortal soul, and that cannot be destroyed. Now whether it returns to this little speck of dust called earth in another form, uh, metempsychosis, uh, tra metamtransmigration, um, in that the soul can pass at death into not just another human, but another form altogether, an animal, a vegetable, uh, possibly onto other, uh, what do you call it, galaxies and dimensions and so on. But all of that is never, never destroyed. So, we're either dead, these extraterrestrials, these gods, can raise us from the dead, from the grave, just by taking a little bit of the DNA, much like uh, Jurassic Park, and raising you up. And it says in the Genesis, you will know your friends and your loved ones as you did when you were asleep. Asleep! <laughs> So, you know, talk about Humphrey Bogart's movie, The Big Sleep. So it could be thousands of years, yet just the dust contains everything about you that is you. So it's not a replica of you. You're not a walking zombie. You're, uh, you're, you will be you again. That's the second possibility. And then this electrical spark, which is part and parcel of the physical body and the universe, will be reunited as one. Now that could explain the trying to entomb these bodies so much and preserve them. So the more DNA they would have to replicate that being. And also, I don't know if you've heard this, but Madonna doesn't want anybody getting access to any type of her DNA, whether it be you know a hair sample or anything. And I know that she's very metaphysical. You know, she does study hermetics and the occult a lot. I mean, you can tell by the the videos that she does, and that's fine. That's her path. Uh, maybe that's why, because she doesn't want someone to get access to her hair and make up a, a voodoo doll or something and, you know, sabotage her astrally or something like that. I mean, there's plenty of speculations you can get to, but I mean, another thing that I was very fascinated with, Anthony, I mean, you've got so many incredible prophecies, and I mean, just hitting these on these 10 that I want to discuss with you um, is, is taking 
probably a little bit longer than an hour or so. If, if we need to cut out short, I understand. Or um, if we can continue, that'd be great. But I've got just a few more on here that I think are really important because one of them you talk about a wave of new pneumonia hitting North America, like a big time, horrific, very bad event. And is that something you see happening soon? And could you walk us through that vision? Well, funny you should mention, I was at a doctor's office today and I had said that uh, a, a form of pneumonia will resurface, which will kill off hundreds, if not millions of uh, people, especially the older, older people and the very young. And um, I saw this pamphlet on the, uh, while I was waiting to see the doctor on, uh, on, the, on his uh, desk there, and I picked it up. And what's it say here? You ready for this? Hmm. It says, pneumococcal pneumonia is serious enough to put you in the hospital and worse, uh, but it can be prevented, especially if you are 50 and over. And then it talks about uh, um, uh, who's at risk, you know, of course, 50 years of age and over, or very, uh, very young, uh, 18 and under. And um, it's called, um, uh, any of these infections, it's, it says here, what is pneumococcal disease? It is any infection caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae um, or pneumo, pneumo, pneumococcus. pneumococcus. The okay. most severe manifestations, pneumonia, lung infection, Bac uh, bacteriamic pneumonia, lung infection with bacteria in the bloodstream, sepsis, bacteria in bloodstream, meningitis, inflammation around the brain, and a very good uh, doctor friend of mine's wife was uh, stricken with that just uh, last year and she just pulled through by the uh, by the skin of her teeth. So funny you should mention that and bring this up and I, I picked this up right in the doctor's office and said it is on the increase uh, and the spreading exponentially is what it says. And then, okay, and so another one too that I wanted to bring up was... Well, I, did we talk about this last month? Um, you know, I've always had a theory that Sharks, they can grow new sets of teeth, just as a matter of course. I was wondering why we can't. Uh, uh, amphibians, um, um, frogs, uh, guppies, not guppies, they don't have legs, but frogs, anyway, you cut off a frog's leg, or it'll grow back. I believe we, there's a gene inside us that is very dormant, and all it needs is to be unlocked, and we could... I mean, this fabulous, what I said here, fabulous new surgical technology allows a deformed and truncated limbs to be inserted with donor bone, which adheres to the skeleton by means of the body's natural, quote unquote, glue, for want of a better term. Example, kids born with flipper-like hands attached directly to shoulders. That was that, uh, the little my kids, remember that? I don't know great about it. Uh, and also, kids without arms or their feet that sprung from the hips, but not from the legs, something like E.T., Finally, the discovery of the gene that triggers the growth of new limbs, teeth, etc. If sharks and amphibians can do it, why not us? And I really, really believe in that. You know, 50 years ago, I prophesied that all alphabet diseases, that is to say, MS and ALLS, ALD respectively, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It's uh, interesting to note, lately they've said that Lou Gehrig didn't die from Lou Gehrig's disease, he died from something else. So Lou Gehrig did not die of the disease named after him, apparently. Uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, that was his. Then there's the Lorenzo's oil. And I knew the, I knew the mother and the aunt. Of, you remember the movie, Lorenzo's oil? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the aunt uh, of this uh, young boy uh, was the sister of the, of the mother. And uh, as a matter of fact, very interesting. She was, uh, she was a nun, and uh, her husband was uh, a former priest. Dominican priest, I think, and they left the priesthood to get married. I mean, it's almost like the old joke, you know, who's your father? Well, he's a priest, and you, you know, <laughs> and they had to right. So anyway, uh, all these will soon be eradicated. So it's, it's you know, uh, with remarkable success, a holistic approach to mental disease, including manic depression, schizophrenia, uh, et al., brings about their control through a regime of strict diet and mild electricity whose minerals and current directly affects the brain's serotonin and synapses, again going back to the electrical 
balancing of the soul, if you want, or that electrical spark. And currently, uh, you know, you have to remember, um, you don't have to, but I suggest uh, you remember that I've been writing these predictions, the same ones for 50 years, uh, without putting a, a, a time limit of 12 months on them. So we're very close to solve, solving all these problems of regenerating severed nerve endings of spinal cord injuries. Uh, hence, ever my refrain, dead legs shall walk again. Again, I prophesied over a half a century ago that all of the above medical problems soon would be, uh, uh, will be eradicated. And now miraculously, through stem cell research, all this is now coming to pass. So, um, I really think, now, you remember the movie with the Brad Pitt, the Benjamin Button? Uh-huh, yeah, where he reverses age. Right, now, there is a disease, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, uh, uh, which I'm sure is called progeria. P-R-O-G-E-R-I-A. These are children who are born old and grow older exponentially. Uh, now, Brad Pitt starred in an interesting movie called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, a medical anomaly similar to the above-mentioned disease. Science soon will locate and identify the aberrant gene that triggers this horrible affliction as well as the slower, more familiar one we refer to as old age, and then reverse it. Therefore, the need for souls and beings, uh, for new souls and beings will cease as the process repeats, and thus shall it be with new limbs and new teeth. So, you know, scientists clone a live Tyrannosaurus rex from the cell nucleus of the dust of its long dead bones, in which resides the DNA, deoxyribonucleic nucleic acid. So, wow, maybe, they'll sell them as pets and guard dogs, sort of like guard dinos, <laughs> or dinos. Then we can walk or hop them <laughs> each free area at the beach or boardwalk where they can romp, chomp, and frolic with the other dinos and doggies. <laughs> Look what my dino can do. <laughs> <laughs> I predict stem cell implantation will ultimately bring about something akin to immortality. Repair to new eyes, kidneys, brains, hearts, such a damaged hat. Damaged hat. A damaged heart is currently repairing itself with the owner's very own stem cells in Montreal, even now as you and I speak, Rex. So... Um, I'm looking, i got to interject real quick here, Anthony. I'm looking at an article that came out. There's several of these that I've read in the same reference. It's, man's finger grows back thanks to pig bladder powder. And you can watch the video time-lapse where this guy literally regrows his finger out of his house based on some biotech that the college, uh, it's in South Florida, this doctor uses pig bladder, basically powder, and sprinkles it on his finger like pixie dust and after a couple of weeks it regrows it's pretty cool so that kind of interjects there i think in, in parallels with what you're talking about if you can do stuff like that out of your own house regrow your finger with some help from your college buddies that's that's pretty amazing are you kidding me or this is already no I just, I'll, i'm gonna it's uh, i'll send the link for our listeners and people that have an opportunity to watch this podcast youtube.com slash clandestine time lord make sure to subscribe get access to all the latest podcasts first and free yeah this is the real deal there's been many articles that i've read about this guy but one in specific that i'm looking at right now is on the huffington post and you can actually watch a minute video on it that shows how the whole process was done in in 60 seconds so it's pretty cool and the the technologies that we have the opportunity to be a part of now is amazing if you look at some of the nanotech i know that they're using very small um, like nanotech chips that will piggyback off of certain bacteria now, and that bacteria will go to a certain part of the body, and then the nano chip releases whatever it's going to be used for, and the, it's pretty incredible what they're going to be able to do in the future. So certainly I like your parallels that you bring with the Bible and some of the prophecies that were talked about back then. People look at it more spiritually, I guess you could say, or religiously that have got that dogmatic background. And when I say dogmatic, all I mean by that is certain principles and rules and regulations that you live by. Now, what you're referring to, though, makes a lot more practical sense, in my opinion, because when you talk about some of the parallels of what we're doing now and the reference points in the Old Testament, you know, bringing people back from what it was like when they are in that dream state, that sounds to me like reincarnation, you know, taking the DNA and making another body like the film that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in, The Sixth Day, where they basically plug and play bodies. And it's very interesting to, to bring up these possibilities, and that, that's fascinating. Now, the next thing I was going to ask you about here is you talk about the big players in this World War III scenario, the, the large red stars, Yugoslavia and the Balkans about to explode, Australia, New Zealand thrust onto the world stage with warships and missiles, a Russian politician assassinated. I just wanted to throw that all in the same, uh, you know, 
what? paragraph there. Yeah, so talk to us about that. I mean, give us some visions and, and options, what you think that means. Is that all a part of the World War III scenario? It is. I, that, that particular uh, vibe, the picture has been with me for a long, 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 long time. I can't seem to rid myself of it. It just seems sort of in between New Zealand and Australia. There's a, a gathering or a theater of um, the um, um, uh, jet, what do you call them? Um, aircraft carriers and ships and battleships and uh, again, ICBMs, missiles. Um, there's something there that everybody wants around in between New Zealand and Australia and they're fighting over it or they're they're gearing up almost whether it comes quite right down to it at that point I'm not certain but it's you know the story about uh, somebody blinked during the during the uh, Cuba crisis with Kennedy and um, Russia when they were setting up missiles bases in Cuba missile bases in Cuba are you talking about the the, the missile Cuba crisis back in the day Right. It feels something akin to that. And there's a standoff, and it's, it can go either way. It's, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen. It, it, someone or something backs down right at the last minute. It doesn't go, it doesn't go the whole nine yards, and then they'll back off or go back. Everybody backs away from it. Uh, this picture I've had in my mind's eye for many, many years. It's getting larger and larger. With my predictions and my visions, it's akin to looking through the wrong end of a pair of binoculars. It's either very, very small and far away, and as it draws closer, it draws nigh, it begins to look larger and looms a lot closer, as though I turned around and discovered I was looking through the wrong end of the, tele of the binoculars. So this here seems to be getting closer and closer. What it is exactly, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, also, as we speak, you and I get to the... the What's that, Mariana Trench? Which word? The Mariana Trench. It's supposed to be the deepest part of the ocean that uh, I believe the, what's the name, the director of uh, the Titanic went down there um, last year. It was four, what, four or five miles. He went down to one of those deep sea bubbles. Oh, very cool. Sorry? Oh, I said very cool. I hadn't heard about that. Oh, uh, the Titanic, uh, the last Titanic movie with... Um, uh, DiCaprio, and uh, he's from Toronto, the uh, the director. did a lot of those movies with Schwarzenegger. Um, um, you know, James Trump. Cameron. James Cameron, right. As we speak, I mean, now, is Mariana Trench around there? It's coming to me as I was telling you this story. So that's that's fascinating. Is, is it there? Um, um, Okay, so let's go back. That you said, ask me the question again. Well, as as I was uh, talking to you about the the, the gathering force, the, the the gathering storm around Australia and the uh, aircraft carriers and IBs, the words the Mariana Trench came to me. Is that around there, Australia, New Zealand? I'm pulling it up right now. That is actually the deep. Okay, so it's located in the Western Pacific Ocean, close to the Marina Islands. I'm going to pull this up right now. And kind of, I mean, it's, it looks like it's in between Japan and Papua New Guinea. So uh, Philippines would be to the left of it. And it's kind of right there by Guam, actually. It's real close to Guam. So it's in the general ballpark. I yeah, it is. Because Australia is south of there. Uh huh. Yeah, so for some reason, I, that area or something about it will trigger this confluence of uh, military activity. Uh, possibly someone wants to test uh, a horrific nuclear device down in the Mariana Trench and other forces are opposed to it. They think, this is coming to me, that it may trigger a chain reaction of all the fault lines in the world. How's that? That just came to me as you told me that. Oh, that sounds like some, some fresh doom right there triggering all fault lines. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you think that... I never knew what that picture until now, you and I discussing it. You're kind of a pretty good catalyst for me. Yeah, fascinating. Fascinating. And I don't know if you've Careful put... what you ask for, you know, uh, Rex, you just might get it. Well, hey, I certainly wouldn't want to be 
close to any fault lines when something like that takes place or next to the coast. I mean, I've got family in the Northwest, and, you know, if, if there was a tsunami or something like that, that, you know, I'd, I'd be definitely worried about them. And also, with all the different possibilities, have you heard of the Planet X theory? Briefly, uh, d- 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 uh, it's a specific planet that. Tangentially. Okay. It's a specific planet that's supposed to have a 3,600-year orbit. There's been every theory under the sun about if it exists or not, but even a lot of researchers now are saying they found something in between Jupiter and Saturn that they can't explain that wasn't there before, some type of planet. And whether or not it's real or it's going to come back and cause chaos, there's, that's certainly on many people's minds right now. And there's been so many catastrophes as far as natural, like sinkholes and earthquakes and a lot of events that have been taking place as well. Some people speculate that might be the cause of some of it. I'm wondering if you've ever had a vision in reference to seeing some type of giant planet in the sky that shouldn't be there or heavenly body. Well, I'll tell you, I uh, don't pick up any catastrophes created by uh, that, you know, uh, planet X or whatever. I do believe there are other, of course, planets out there that are in parallel worlds to our own. However, the uh, um, the extraterrestrials, or the as the, the ancients called them, the Anunnaki, I think it was, the Anunnaki, meaning those who came from the heavens or from the stars. If they're, if God, gods, were, and don't forget, it says in in, um, in the, not only the Christian Bible, also in the um, um, the Quran and the the Mosaic books, the uh, the Pentateuch. The five mosaic books that the uh, that the Hebrews, the Jewish people, adhere to, always talk about the gods and their their hosts that came from the heavens or came from the skies and the stars. So there's no doubt that something, someone, something or other came uh, from beyond. If if they needed to be uh, within a certain area or within a certain distance from the Earth. That might explain. Perhaps it is one of those planets that has uh, an orbital uh, path of uh, I don't know, you know, a hundred thousand years before it comes back to the nearest point to the uh, to the to the Earth again. The and I was got those two words mixed up: the apogee and the other one, which means one means closest point from a heavenly body to another one, and there's another word that means the opposite. But don't ask me; I don't even know my own name at this point. <laughs> anyway. I think that's how they would manage to jump from that planet to Earth. It's interesting to note that the 18th Psalm in the Book of Psalms, which talks and describes perfectly to me uh, about a UFO, you know, uh, again, was, was God a star traveler, which talks about uh, um, a UFO uh, uh, rising from Mount Sinai. And uh, do you do you have it there in uh, you have it there in um, uh, in my uh, book that I sent you? Was now there is uh, for years I've always been mesmerized by the um, the ancient Egyptian scarab. Oh yeah, yep. You flip it upside down. Okay, I am. I'm looking at it right now. Yes. I accidentally took a coffee table book, and it talks about you know this. The uh, scarab beetle, which is a beetle, a dung beetle, goes around eating poop, basically. I said, why would anyone in his right or wrong mind worship a, a beetle, you know, a dung beetle at that, right? Right. Until I held it up, and it was a dark and stormy night, and it was, and it was raining, and it was a storm blew lightning, kind of like Mary Shelley in the original Frankenstein. And the book, Crack of Lightning, came through the window, and the book jumped out of my hand and then landed on the ground. I picked it up and I picked it up upside down and I looked at it. I said, my God, no pun intended. I said, this is not a dung beetle at all. I said, look at this. We've been looking at this thing the wrong way, the wrong side up for 5,000 years. If you look at it upside down, which to me is right side up, it is a spacecraft taken off. If you, do you have the picture there? Uh, yes, right. I sure do. I'm looking at it right now. It says not this side up, right? Mm-hmm. But this side up with the, with the bird mm-hmm. up, uh, uh, upside down. You, you see the wings? You see the you see the at the bottom of it the blast site that the flames? Mm-hmm. The thrusters? I sure do. 
See the throat and, and around it are the legs, the tripod of which on which it rested. Mm -hmm. I those sure do. Are the wings, those are the scarab beetle, or not wings of it. Those are the bright lights and the power and the fire as the thing is lifting off. Yeah, I'm looking right at it. You can see it with the outline, and it looks kind of like a, a space shuttle that would land or as it's blasting off. And you so, can see, yep. And uh, see and and you know, you look at the lights. So now, can you see the can you see the spaceship now as I had it outlined here? Now. Whoever or whatever came to this earth, perhaps they had to be close enough to be able to make the, I mean, when you think of space travel these days, you think of uh, quantum physics and quantum leaps with mm -hmm. step wormholes and, and no time exists at all. You don't need to traverse the, the, the fathomless uh, oceans of uh, cosmic space and time. If you think of uh, the fan, one of those slow-moving overhead fans like uh, in Casablanca, Humphrey Bogart, those slow moving blades, if you think of one dimension to another, if, if you're on that sympathetic vibration level, you could actually just step through those blades, through the, through the spaces of the blades as they roll, and into another dimension. So you would think they would be able to do that. Maybe they weren't that far advanced at that time. They needed a spacecraft like this, like a rocket ship or the shuttle, which would explain why a planet like Planet X would have to be at a, a certain proximity from the Earth for them to make the journey. How else, or why else would they need a rocket ship on Mount Sinai? Which now, if you read the 18th Psalm, and you, uh, it, it makes more sense. And what, here's what it says. There is a passage in the Bible which describes the landing of a huge spacecraft. God, in the form of a star traveler, helps David defeat his enemies. So, from Psalm 18, quote, In my distress, I called upon, this is David talking now, right? But he's feeling uh, he's going to be wiped out. In my distress, I call upon the Lord for help. In the brackets, I put. So David is in trouble, so he communicates with his protector, the star traveler on Mount Sinai. Continues, quote, From his temple, brackets, the UFO, he heard my voice, and I am saved from mine enemies. Brackets, message received and understood. To continue. Then the earth reeled and rocked. Just like Chuck Berry's song, reeling and rocking. Anyway, then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. So in brackets, I got the powerful engines of the spacecraft caused earth-like reverberations throughout the immediate area. To continue, then smoke went up from his nostrils, that is to say emissions from the rocket exhausts, and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals did flame forth from him, meaning the heat from the engines burns the grasses, shrubs, and kindles stones in the immediate vicinity of the blast site. The heat becomes so intense as the engines accelerate that small rocks in the vicinity of the thrusting, blasting rockets begin to ignite. To continue, then he rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He smote, that is to say, killed my enemies with arrows of lightning. Arrows of lightning? Brackets, I put. Laser rays from the UFOs. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the most high uttered his voice, uttered his voice at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Brackets. The, the craft rumbled, and it roared and accelerated overhead. Like the last sentence I put. No wonder David sang the Lord's praises. He would have been a dead duck without him. Now that's the 18th song. I don't know what, you know, people, oh, it was an earthquake. No, 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 arrows of lightning flowing high, thundering voice overhead. These are the engines, the, the jets flying, the whole schmear. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, my friend, I see by the old clock on the wall, um, can we continue this uh, another time, or...? That'd be fantastic. You know, it's certainly always great to speak with you. And maybe next time we have the opportunity to speak, Anthony, we could talk about some of the star charts and different ways to do palm readings and stuff. Sure, sure. or if you want, we can we can go Hollywood. We can do all the, the stories and the anecdotes about all the celebrities I've read for and how I came about. Oh, yeah. that'd be wonderful. Absolutely. That's, that'd be fantastic. And Jacqueline herself is a whole, it's a whole other. Actually, we should get her on and do a show together. Oh, that'd be uh, just an absolute pleasure. And anything that we can do to help, please let us know. You know, and let me ask you this. You, you've met, like, Howard Stern. You've met Roseanne Barr. 
you've yep. met Sylvester Stallone and his family and, and all these pictures that I've seen you in with them. It seems like they're just so happy to be around you. Like you guys have known each other forever. Well, they're, you know, it's the Italian blood. What can I say? Santi and a pinky me. I'll cut you cojones off. Huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's is, is awesome. This, is this family oriented show, or can we use a little profanity once in a while? Uh, I mean, hey, if you want to throw a couple words out there, I mean, I, that's okay. <laughs> coast to coast. I mean, if you say damn, it's like going back to uh, Gone with the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're oh, a little stricter. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Well, you know what you would have said these days, right? Dare right. I say it? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a f. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. It's a, it's a little bit of a different genre we live in today. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we plan on that? I'll I'll get a hold of Jacqueline. She's ninety four, but she's still you know game. And um, maybe we can we can set up something for the next uh, for the next show. That'd be fantastic. gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. We have returning guest Anthony Carr from anthonycarrpsychic.com, the world's most documented psychic. We had him on here a few weeks ago, and one of the predictions that he made live during the podcast, well, it was out in Astoria, Oregon, close to a drawbridge out there, and I got information about two weeks after we did that presentation from an anonymous source showing documents that there is a multi-million dollar, multi-year project in that same area that has a natural gas pipeline out there, and they just shut it down with no reason as to why, no explanation. They just said, we're shutting it down, we're sorry, that's it. And I don't know what they know that we don't. Also, I need to bring up that a prediction that Mr. Carr made before Mount St. Helens erupted the first time back in, I think, 1980. And he made a prediction again in 2012 that Mount St. Helens is going to erupt again, and it's going to be worse than it was the first time. Now, another thing interesting is when we had the presentation last time, we talked about uh, Astoria, Oregon as well, how Mr. Carr saw possibly a plane crash close to that bridge and flames. And what I didn't bring up on the last podcast was I had a friend that actually passed away from a plane accident that he got in out there, and it was a small Cessna. It was just a private plane. That was very interesting. He might have picked up something there. Mr. Carr is acclaimed psychic to the stars, being called the most documented psychic in the world because of all his predictions that have come to fruition, such as the events of 9-11, India's Taj Mahal Acost, the attack on Paris, bin Laden and Gaddafi's death, and many more documented predictions. Now, he's also received repeated accolades from the Toronto Star for his astonishing predictions, and tonight we're going to discuss the top 11 predictions for 2016 and beyond. It was just going to be 10, but I had to throw one more out there that I just figured it has to be on everybody's minds right now. And you talked about this many years ago, Anthony, about Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president, and she's going to be much more of an iron fist than Thatcher was. How are you doing? Thanks a lot for joining us. Well, my pleasure, Rex. And I'm once again very happy to be here. I enjoyed our uh, podcast from last time. And... What were we talking about during our last podcast? Was it the world predictions or was it the Houdini uh, mystery code unrevealed, unraveled? What was the show last time we did? Well, we talked a lot about... Nanny, 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 nanny. Go ahead. Well, you know, I mean, remember last time we talked a lot about the the possibility of our DNA being altered from, you know, an extraterrestrial species, possibly the Anunnaki. Right. And then you made that prediction live on the air, which was incredible. So, you know, one of the things that you've written predictions down now for years, and you've got just so many of them. I picked through some of the gems in your Stargazer updates here, and I wanted to, to just bring up the first one with the, the Hillary Clinton scenario. Now, when you came up with that prediction, I mean, it was quite a long time ago. What was it like, the vision that you had? Well, um, I had uh, envisioned, uh, and remember, these visions do not come with any soundtracks for me. Uh, my grandmother was clear, it was clear audio. This is the one I 
I, I think I mentioned uh, before she missed the Titanic by uh, four hours. Uh huh. And she never saw visions that in that she was not a clairvoyant, but she was uh, clairaudio, clairaudio, clairaudio. She could hear the universe talking to her, and in a sense, or or internalize it, or the sensation of feeling it, the, the vibrations transformed into uh, words in her psyche. And uh, the, the universe, of course, takes pictures of everything. It also records all the sounds. So some people are clairvoyant, that is clear seeing, seeing and others are, um, pardon me, I just washed my mouth, I can't do a thing with it. But the, the clairvoyant, that is clear seeing, as, as pictures in their mind's eye. Their audio, they hear things, hear voices, hear sounds. Others are clairsentient, you get that, as you know, the expression, the gut feeling. When it came to Hillary Clinton, I saw her standing on the podium with four fingers up in the victory sign. This was, oh, 10, 12 years ago, long before uh, she had uh, announced that she was going to run for the presidency the first time. So I had to make out my uh, yearly predictions for my book, Stargazer, Predictions and Prophecies. And so I said I have a strong feeling or strong uh, vision of uh, if I have to interpret the picture correctly in my mind's eye. And quite often, other people could probably interpret my visions better than I can, because as I've said, uh, I have no soundtrack that goes with it, and no subtitles, as in the old silent movies. <laughs> so even I have to guess at what the universe delivers to me, because a lot of people think, believe psychics and the like uh, can manipulate the universe, make things happen as though we are... Um, imbued or endowed with a power um, uh, unlike uh, most other people, but it's not true. We are nothing more than vehicles, much like your computer, your radio, and when it's fine-tuned just correctly, these images and visions and sounds will come through. Quite often, if, if uh, you or anyone else is looking at the screen in my mind's eye, which is controlled by the third eye or the pineal gland, which is between your two eyes, your two eyebrows, and slightly above it, which is why we look upward when we're, when we're uh, trying to analyze the picture, we're looking heavenwardly. And uh, again, I saw her with her fingers up in, in, in victory, and I thought to myself, well, I says, I got a feeling, oh, and then there was the word president, the presidential race, and the word GOP. And by the way, not to digress too much, what does GOP mean? <laughs> The grand old party. Grand old party. <laughs> That's what it sounds? That's what yeah. it sounds for? Yep. Grand old party. Oh my God. How oh, cracker barrel. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I saw the word president and GOP, so I, I, I took a wild guess and uh, at my own vision and said, I think she'll be the, uh, ultimately she'll be the first woman president of the United States. Well, of course, years later, she came um, perilously close. Um, there's still a very good chance, and I can't renege on my predictions, you know, I have to stand by them because, as you so eloquently put it, I am the world's most documented psychic. It should be subtitles in brackets, but not necessarily, not necessarily always the most accurate. <laughs> so anyway, I, as you well know, I don't make, uh, make any bones about it, I am definitely not a Donald Trump fan, and um, I can't, I mean, he's a great entertainer. Uh, our late mayor, uh, Rob Ford, was very, very entertaining in, in the same uh, uh, ilk as Mr. Trump, and also uh, one of our former mayors, Mayor Lassman, was also of that ilk, very entertaining. And for my money, all you're ever going to get from any politician, no politician is going to change your life at all, one way or the other, whether you like it or don't, except if they happen to be very entertaining, and that's all you're going to get for your vote. If you look at Mr. Trump as an entertainer, he's terrific. If you look at him as a, a presidential hope for it's 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 to be feared and dreaded. I just can't see him becoming uh, becoming president of the United States. Um, to me, to vote for um, uh, Donald Trump would be akin to voting to uh, Adolf Hitler. And I never thought I'd ever say anything good about Hitler, but at least Hitler was a real soldier and that he served in World War One, and uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, with his money, uh, bought himself uh, out of uh, Vietnam, but he seems to be very quick to want to send everybody else's kids to war. So I don't have much use, as we've already discussed, for spoiled rich kids, you know, who were brought up with a silver spoon in their mouths. Not just him, 
Uh, the, even here in Canada, you have your Conrad Black, you have your uh, our Prime Minister, um, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, I have all the respect in the world for a man uh, and a woman who can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and make it on their own without anybody handing it to them because anyone that's spoiled really doesn't know what it's like on the other side uh, of the spectrum to be that poor, uh, to have to come up the hard way, to have people look down on you. He will never, or anybody like him, will never really, really enjoy what they have. They may think they're enjoying their cars and their millions and their billions and their women and all these things, and I'm sure they are, but not as much as if they truly had come from dirt, poor, poverty, and then pulled. That way they would have the other side to judge against and to truly appreciate what it really is to be well off. Right. And do you feel that if Trump was to make it into office, when you compare him to Hitler, do you think that he would round people up based upon their lineage and heritage as well, kind of, you know, these roundup camps? Hey, there's a law for the rich, and there's a law for the poor. And basically... Uh, he's he's a white, racist, what do you call it, a white supreme supremacist. And that said, for all his blow and his bluster, if it came right down to it and he actually did become president, I think, being a blowhard, that he would just back down a lot on, on a lot of the things that he's uh, uh, promised to do. Um, I don't think he really has the guts to, to go out in the street and get into what I would call a fist fight in that sense. To, you know, the, the,